So, this is like a talk that's usually an hour long talk. I'm just gonna give it casually, probably go for about 20 minutes. So you'll see me slip through, skip through some slides or adjust based on how much time I think I have. Um, which, let me pull up my, my clock so I can keep, keep an eye on that. So, basically I wanted to talk a bit about mental health hackers, how we got started, why we got started, mental health in general in the industry. Uh, so, just a quick introduction of what we're dealing with in the industry. We've got our very well-known mental health disorders, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, ADHD, and so much more. Schizophrenia, imposter syndrome is in the DSM now, like there's a whole bunch of things. Um, and it, it, it's super common. Just to touch on some of those on the main list. First, bipolar disorder is characterized by cycles of depression and mania. The length of those cycles can vary. Um, which ones are more prominent can vary, etc. cetera. Um, people with bipolar disorder, yeah, the, the, during the depressive phase, just like regular depression, that kind of uh, uh, lack of uh, what we'll talk about. I don't know why they put depression first in the slide deck, but we'll go into depression. And then the mania is kind of these um, times of high energy, high motivation, um, but it also comes with its own problems. Typically, that, that little voice in your head that says no will disappear during these times of mania. People will get kind of like crazy, uh, do a lot of adrenaline-filled activities, things like that. Um, so risks on both sides. Uh, but yeah, that's bipolar. Like I said, depression, you got the feelings of hopelessness, emptiness, loss of interest in your favorite activities or most activities, uh, irritability over small things and abnormal sleeping habits. Anxiety, this is a big one, especially in our industry for some reason. I've seen depression and anxiety all over the place. Insecurity is a very common one that you'll hear people talk about. Um, it's typically characterized by fear of interacting with strangers, fear of embarrassment, avoiding being the center of attention, and you may avoid interactions that you're worried will lead to that embarrassment. And then the last one I just wanted to touch on, oh wait, or that was it, uh, ADHD we hear a lot about in the industry, um, I myself am autistic, uh, and it comes with a little touch of depression and anxiety and ADHD all over. I kind of get a lot of these feelings. Um, so, so, and it, the list goes on. So by the numbers, what are we looking at uh, in terms of the general population? Overall, one in five adults experience a mental health condition every year. And uh, the reason we say condition, and there's these two separate experiences, uh, two separate uh, categorizations is because um, these mental health conditions, you know, we get things like seasonal depression, um, a lot of physical health conditions can manifest in mental health um, symptoms, and so you may experience, for example, I have thyroid disease, um, and when it's not managed well enough, uh, I'll, I'll experience depression. And so sometimes it'll pop up like that as, as a symptom of something uh, bigger, but it's just this temporary, like, work around. Whereas one in 17, which is still a huge number, uh, like how many people are at this conference do you estimate? Do you know how many registrations you got? Yeah. 100. So what like an eighth of people here uh, probably are experiencing a serious mental health issue using that that kind of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm losing words, using that proportion, um, you know, that's talking about out of this building, every eighth person you meet could potentially be facing a serious mental illness. And that is those that long life depression with uh, suicidal thoughts, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism. One in 17. I myself, like I said, autistic in this room. I know Chris talks about his battles with depression and alcoholism. So in this room, <laughs> that's already 50% at least. Uh, so this is a very common thing, even, even these long term. Um, conditions. And in terms of onset, 50% uh, of people with long-term mental health conditions are diagnosed by the age of 14. I personally fell into that. 75% uh, by the age of 24. So in terms of us in the industry, most people at, in the kind of roles we are, they're at least 20, oh, they're 
in their mid to late 20s, a few early 20s here and there. Um, but that means that like for those who are likely going to experience mental health conditions, uh, we've, we've gotten to that point before we're even in the industry. With some exceptions, of course, autism, it wasn't uh, widely diagnosed in like the 60s, 70s, so a lot of people in their 40s, 50s, 60s now are just now getting diagnosis um, just because it wasn't uh, diagnosed as well back then. Um, but in general, uh, usually if you're going through some of this stuff, you're going to experience it quite early in your life. Uh, this is a quote. Uh, a semicolon, a lot of you have probably seen the semicolon to represent a uh, depression and suicide as like, uh, you know, people got tattoos, it was really big, I feel like five or six years ago, everyone was doing the semicolon, so you just want to touch quick on what that means, um, and it's, it was used to represent, and we even have it in our, oh, this is our original logo, if you look at the Mental Health Hackers logo, there's a butterfly, and the body of the butterfly is in the shape of a semicolon, and it's used because the author could have ended their sentence, but they chose not to. So it's, it's kind of that su uh, survival of suicide attempts. So it's time for change, and so we're going to beat the change. This is where I kind of dive a little bit into mental health hackers and our backgrounds. Uh, so we started in October. Mental health hackers did start in October 2018, but our journey did. Uh, Amanda Berlin, our CEO, Info Sister, she decided she, she came up with this idea of a space at conferences herself having faced anxiety um, in the past, imposter syndrome. She knows that at conferences, sometimes all of this can be a lot. In our industry, we have a lot of introverts too. So spending eight hours walking around, consistently meeting people can be a lot. So when DerbyCon 8 rolled around, she had this idea of how about I submit a village that's a space where people can go to escape, relax, chill out. And there seemed to be interest, so she launched a GoFundMe with a goal of, I think it was like two, three thousand dollars um, to cover things like you see in our room, the inflatable um, loungers and coloring books and crafts and stickers and everything. Ended up getting seven thousand dollars from the cybersecurity community instead of three. And the event was a massive success. We'll skip ahead just to shuffle. Here's photos from our inaugural event. We had talks, we had yoga, we had these inflatable air loungers that were super popular. It was a great time, immediate success, immediately, like, you can see October 2018, she did this thing as like an idea that came to mind. November 2018, we're officially a nonprofit in the state of Ohio. And that's because within the first, Within those first couple weeks after DerbyCon, we had she had tons and tons of conferences hitting her up. Hey, can you come here? Hey, can you come here? She's like, well, if we're gonna do this, like we're gonna need donations. If we're raising money, like we don't want to be doing GoFundMe's every week. So really, the only way to do this is to establish a nonprofit, which we did. And during this time period from November uh, onwards, we we continued villages. I think. Just in those, just by the end of 2018, we had done maybe four more in three months. Oh, one of them I think was in Germany too. So uh, we were very active from the onset. In April 2019, we got our 501c3 status. Obviously, it takes a little bit longer. We had to work with some lawyers, etc. But we got it. We're officially a 501c3. It allows us to do things like corporate sponsors, tax exemptions, etc. And here we are today, B-Size KC, many, many, many <laughs> villages later. I know this is our second or third year? Second, second year with you, hopefully, not the last. Not. Um, <laughs> so our intent is to, a lot of the villages that have brought us um, in previous years, we typically come back. So it's, it's been great. Uh, that shows our success rate. We well, There's probably half a dozen at least conferences that bring us every year since we started. So. Um, here we are, uh, I got some pre-COVID stats. I admittedly need to get back on finding these statistics, but before COVID, so around, I think this was documented maybe summer of 2019, we had already spent 
over $15,000 in massages. So when people didn't mind being touched by strangers before a pandemic took over the world, <laughs> we would hire massage therapists to come in and give free chair massages. Uh, so yeah, we spent a lot of money on that, but it was a huge hit. We've had over 20 hours of yoga instruction at event, uh, over 2,000 stickers. And at the time, 70 plus volunteers. I checked this morning and we now have 145 volunteers in our Slack. Uh, so the other things we've done since um, that we've expanded on during COVID, um, COVID became a real challenge because the village is our staple of it. And we could not host villages when there's not conferences. We tried the online format a couple times, like, but when you're a place to chill out, escape from the noise, uh, color, crafts, talk, like, it's, it's rough. So we did have some Zoom sessions where we had special people come give guest talks. Um, one of our big COVID time efforts was we sent out feel good uh, boxes. So basically people could nominate coworkers, friends, family, who they thought could use a little bit pick me up. Uh, and we sent them a box full of um, anything from cybersecurity stuff to mental health related stuff, journals, stickers, shirts. Um, and we got, we got obviously pretty positive feedback from that. No one, uh, no one's unhappy to receive a random box of, of, of stuff. Um, so, so that was kind of some things we did during COVID, but luckily, Moving back to normalcy, I myself had this year have done DEF CON, Blue Team Con here, besides Charm and besides Nashville, I think, uh, are mine so far this year. And then pre COVID, I was doing five to six villages a year. Um, because me and Amanda actually have full time jobs and we do not make enough money through the nonprofit to do this full time. Uh, we do uh, have volunteers um, who can who have these kits. So we created a version that's basically in a big crate that we ship. Um, so me and Amanda have the big village, but we've got two like mini villages that um, are in different cities, and we just ship them from city to city. So I think we have two or three villages on top of me and Amanda's big villages, which means we could technically simultaneously run five villages at a time, which works out because we did one weekend, I believe, run three at a time. So I was in Texas running one, someone was in like DC running one, and someone was in like Washington State running one. It was, it was great. Um, so we've really expanded our capabilities. We're trying to take this everywhere, anywhere that will bring us. Um, because the only, the, the, the one good thing about the COVID shutdown is our amazing supporters continue to financially support us. Even though we weren't running the villages, they didn't pull their funding. We, we had almost every, we have a Patreon and almost every Patreon continued to contribute. Hacker One, as well as, oh, I forget the name of the, uh, anti sci the uh, Black Hills Influencing Black Training. Hills. Yeah, the uh, Hacker One and them both give portions of their sales to us. So our bank account built up, which the good thing is, uh, we used to kind of have to really push conferences to help us find sponsors who would pay for like our flights and hotels. But we managed to raise so much during our downtime that we're now able to support kind of the smaller conferences that don't have the sponsors. We don't have to kind of put that pressure on them of, hey, like, but we're not paying for it. Um, so this year we, we got to go full ramp. It's, Basically, anyone who asked, as long as it wasn't an issue with our availability, uh, we tried going there. So that's that's been really great. It's so like the whole concept here. Um, when when we announce, the Twitter trolls will find any and every way to hate on someone. Uh, I have I have often attacked on Twitter, and I I just laugh at it at this point. Um, so when we first announced the formation of Mental Health Hackers. The Twitter trolls attacked us. They told us this was a horrible idea because we were not mental health professionals and we didn't know what we were talking about. Um, and so my first idea was like, hey Amanda, uh, I could go get my PhD in psychology and then nobody could say anything. She's like, how about, <laughs> let's not go that far. Um, I'm still willing to, I'll take the bullet. I really like psych in college, you know? Uh, do what you gotta do. Uh, I always love to shut down a Twitter troll. So she was smarter and decided to instead back up her, her decision with science. 
Uh, and if you ask her, she's got about 5,000 articles on peer support and the success rate of peer support saved. The same reason AA works, you know? It's a group of people facing similar issues, discussing our issues, finding solutions, uh, just it's even just being there together. Like even if you're not, you don't want to open up and talk about it. That's why I'm very vocal about my autism and I try and slip it, I'll just slip into conversations. Like <laughs> I even sometimes feel myself feel weird, like saying, oh, I'm autistic or oh, this because of autism, because culture has told me like you, you keep these things silent. So that's one of the things like I tried to do as a peer support and as a, a member of mental health hackers is just in conversation. Like I'll do something or sell something and I'll be like, oh, there's the autism coming out, you know, or like, oh yeah, I can't really do that because of blah, 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 resulting from my autism, trying to casually bring it up because it's that peer support that, that we're trying to aim for. Um, that when you walk into the mental health village, you hear a group of people sitting around talking about their recent battles with depression and, and what they're doing to try and improve themselves and like, oh, I've tried this and this works and that. Even if you don't want to talk about it, you don't feel that level of comfort, I feel like there's something comforting about just seeing a collective group. It's always amazed me seeing these groups of people form in the village to talk about these topics that historically have been no-no topics. They'll talk about it openly with each other. Um, I think that's the end of the slides I created for this, but I'll just touch on a couple more things. Um, companies, a big thing that we try to talk about is we try to gather resources for how companies can support their employees from a mental health perspective. Uh, Deloitte does a lot. Um, they have a lot of programs. IBM, who I work for, I've seen it come up more and more as a topic. Um, there's a lot of things we can try and do as organizations, as managers. One, like I said, peer support, open discussion. If my manager is open about their mental health issues they're facing, I'm going to feel comfortable being open. If they're not, then I'm like, uh, do I say something? Like, are they going to treat me differently? So creating that culture where you know you can be comfortable. Outside of culture, how do we support them from a benefits perspective? Um, Companies, the idea of a limited PTO has come. I think in concept it's great. There's always that thing of, but now you feel the pressure of like, how much can you actually take? Um, so really enforcing not just, hey, you have this unlimited PTO, but you need to. I saw Leslie, uh, they were posting on Twitter the other day a whole thread about yeah. this. And they said that they get unlimited PTO, but not only that, because a bunch of people went, well, that sucks because then you feel the pressure to not take it. And they said, well, actually, we enforce it. And if you, we look and we see you haven't taken PTO recently, then we're gonna message you, you, hey, you haven't taken PTO, like, refresh, get out of here. And if they don't, hey, uh, manager, your employee, like, they, they need this break. So it's really great reinforcing that. Um, at a health benefits level, uh, does your insurance allow you to um, file claims for, for therapy, like visiting therapy? Do they support your mental health, not just your physical health? If I get sick or I break a bone, I automatically am like, oh yeah, put on my insurance. Like they'll cover at least some of it. But when I think about my mental health things, oh, what about my meds for mental health? What about my therapy appointments? What about, uh, you know, all of these different things I don't immediately say, oh yeah, insurance has got it. Because I don't know, because that's very hit or miss. It depends on your employer and what they've agreed to cover. Um, so there's a lot we can do from a business perspective. Um, mental health factors, like I said, we're very focused on community. Like sometimes your company doesn't do it. Sometimes you're depressed and you're having these mental health crises because you've been laid off. Like we've, we meet a lot of people who email us or come up to us in villages, hey, I got laid off, life sucks. Like, I don't know what to do. They don't have their company supporting them, so we as a community need to be supporting each other. Um, so I think that's the gist of it. Like I said, it was pretty casual. I know Chris knows a lot about the organization, um, but I just wanted to kind of hit some of those key topics. Uh, it was a very mishmash of topics, but it's uh, important that uh, I get kind of a high level out there. You guys can understand why I'm doing what I'm doing and why we're doing what we're doing with mental health factors. Um, but in general, I just 
encourage you all to uh, be there for your peers. Uh, that's that's our biggest mission is, is being more open about mental health um, and sharing that. So thank you for your time. Um, and I'll uh, any questions? I guess. I don't. Know.